everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I know a couple of you guys were here in the morning session, um, but we're going to repeat some of the demos that you might have seen before. Um, so apologies if you see some of this stuff twice. Um, we want to get a single recording that um, captures all of this stuff in one place. <clears throat> so um, hi, I'm Dirk, um, and this is David and Takehito, and we're uh, three-fourths of the Pixar GPU team. And we're here to talk to you today about Open Subdiv. Um, so Open Subdiv is a, is a software, is a library that um, client 3D applications can use to manipulate and draw subdivision surfaces. Um, it's a, it's a, this is a result of a, a collaboration between Microsoft Research and Pixar R&D, uh, specifically Charles Loop and Matthias Nessner of, uh, of, of Microsoft, um, <clears throat> and Tony DeRose and Mark Meyer of, uh, of Pixar, with the original researchers here. Um, we introduced this at uh, SIGGRAPH 2012, um, in, in, in Los Angeles, and what we're here today it t is we're introducing a, a number of new features um, that weren't present in the, in the beta that we showed at SIGGRAPH this summer. Um, and finally, and most importantly, this is an open source project. Um, this is Pixar's first open source project. Um, so all of the code is available on GitHub. Um, we developed this as a, as a, as a third-party library. Um, so at Pixar, we download the code directly from GitHub and build it as a third-party library, just like we do Ptex. And this includes the source code, and it includes um, intellectual property. The patents, um, the patents governing subdivision surfaces that we use at Pixar are also released as part of Open Subdiv. And we know that that's been an issue in the past. So briefly, um, subdivision advantages. Um, subdivision surfaces offer flexible topology. Um, they allow you to set up any kind, of, any, any kind of topology that you want and still get an organic, smooth surface as a result. Um, that's very important for us in the past. People have used patches of NURBS, set, you know, sequences of NURBS patched together, and it was always hard to get continuity between the sections and still be smooth. So subdivision surfaces, we found, um, really have given us that, um, that, that advantage. Um, there's a number of features um, that we're going to show you a in a little bit, including semi-sharp creases, hierarchical edits, boundary interpolation rules, and other things that allow you to get a compact representation and to give you a lot of control over the, over, over the generated surface. Um, so let me do. do, do. Um, so here we have an example. Um, this is a little standalone viewer that we have. Um, we're also going to show this integrated with Autodesk Maya. Um, but here you have a here you have a very simple mesh. Uh, you start out with these eight CVs, and these eight CVs generate that smooth organic limit surface that you see there. And then you can go in and you can start adding things like creases onto that surface. Here we've got all the all the red lines are creased, and the green line is not, and we have a nice smooth surface that results from that. This is all annotation, which still, which still only, only on those original eight CVs. Um, so this is, I, I, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but this is some of the things that you can do with, with, excuse me for one second, um, with some of the gains that we get out of subdivision surfaces. Um, Pixar has been in using subdivision surfaces for quite a while. Um, this dates back to Ed Catmull's original um, 78 paper. Um, and that's where we get Catmull Clark subdivision from. In terms of production, um, we, we've really been using it um, for all of our production uses since about 98, um, when I worked with uh, Tony DeRose and, a number, and Bill Reeves in terms of in integrating this into our pipeline. Um, currently, we use this for every, sub, every, every surface that we draw, every character, every set. Um, ver with very few exceptions, all are done with Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces. And they seem to be getting a lot of, they seem to be pretty ubiquitous in at least the animated film industry. Um, so we think that um, we think that there's something we want to promote, and we want other people, we want people in the industry to use. Some of the things about um, about rent, uh, about Open Subdiv, a key one for us is consistency across the entire tool chain. Um, this uh, Open Subdiv exactly matches RenderMan. It does that by sharing a, a library with RenderMan, and it's important for us to be able to, in our Presto animation system, to be able to see the exact same surface that you see in RenderMan, and we'd like to try to promote this and build this to our advantage to be able to have the same, the, the same, the same surface appear in, in third-party packages such that you can trust the image that you see all the way down your tool chain. Um, we also have um, uh, UV and PTEX texturing support, supported that we're going to show you a little later. And, and finally, this is, um, it's a very high-performance library. Um, we and the GPU team are very much performance geeks, um, and we spend a lot of time making sure this is very fast. Um, and we think you'll be impressed with the performance that you'll see. A little bit about um, feature adaptive evaluation. This is the new um, feature that we've introduced um, at, with release 1.0. And, and the deal here is that instead of uniformly subdividing the entire surface, 
we look for individual locations that we want to add more detail. Um, so for instance here, you can see around, we'll add more, we'll, we'll subdivide more here, but not in flatter areas. This, is allow, this allows us to be much more efficient when we're generating our geometry and allows us to utilize um, GPU tessellation hardware um, and, streaming, you know, and, and streaming memory to, be, to use much less GPU memory and to do, um, to be, to, to do a number of things that, that you'll see in a little bit. Um, so briefly, this is uniform subdivision. This is what we showed um, at SIGGRAPH this summer. So what we have here is the, um, the, on the CPU side, the only thing that you have is the topology and points. Um, this is just the coarse mesh, not all of, that, all of that high resolution geometry. And then what we do is we send down to the GPU these subdivision tables. And then on the GPU, we compute, um, we, we, we do Catmull Clark subdivision on the GPU and generate our VBOs and draw them. Um, and now the new thing that we've added here is that instead of just generating the, G generating the, the VBO directly and drawing it, um, we generate a series of patches, and then we hand those patches down to tessellation hardware in OpenGL or DirectX, and then use the tessellation hardware to, 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 to at, at a high, with very high performance, um, generate, generate the resulting surface on the fly. Um, and what does that mean? So the, the original ed paper was um, recursive, recursively generated B-spline surfaces, and that's really what we are actually doing, getting back to, getting back to that original paper. Here you see that this particular face um, is, a, is what's called a regular face. And so from that face and its surrounding vertices, we can generate this, under, th this underlying um, bicubic B-spline. And that's the, that's the patch that we're dicing on hardware. Um, and around extraordinary vertices, we recursively go through and subdivide around those to be able to generate exact, uh, exact Captain Clark representations. And we do the same thing around creases. So, so we can see this on this guy. Let me. Um, uh, let me turn on patch color. Um, so here, here, if I turn on uniform, you can see what we're talking about. So this is uniform subdivision. We've gone through and subdivided the mesh completely uniformly across, uh, across those patches. And this works great and, and gives you very controllable results and gives you tessellations that, that have nice patterns. But as you try to really bump up, as you try to really bump up the resolution, you start to see, wow, you know, we're generating hundreds of thousands of primitives, but we're generating all of them in these flat areas, these areas that we really don't need to generate all of those vertices. And what we're doing in, with uniform subdivision is we're storing all of that topology. We have to generate subdivision tables for every one of those. And, and that can get expensive, particularly in GPU memory, which is pretty precious these days. So when you switch to adaptive, um, let me go back to shaded here, what we do is we generate these patches. So here we've seen, here, we, here we're around these, around these creases, and around here, and around here, we've generated these cubic patches. And when you look at the tessellation patterns here, let me drop down a little bit, other direction. You can see that we only need to we only need to um, we only need to we only need to generate a few CVs up up here on the top, and then we can generate as many CVs as we want um, around those creases, and then we can bump up the tessellation levels very adaptively. So that's that's kind of what adaptive subdivision is giving us. It's giving us a much higher performance representation to show to show the user. Um, so to, to sum it up, feature adaptive advantages. In terms of performance, it, definitely memory and speed. Come on, come on up. Um, memory and speed is a big win for us. All of the vertices that you saw there are exactly on the Catmull Clark limit surface. There's no approximation going on, um, and that's something that's important for us for that for the consistency point that we made before. Um, we're generating analytical tangents and normals on the GPU for, for displacement. So you have a very well-defined surface. You're not trying to alert normals across a polygon mesh and approximate what the surface is. You just get that directly from the cubic patch definition. And uh, we leverage hard, hardware tessellation. And what we're going to show you in a little bit is um, dynamic level of detail. Sorry, you want to go into your... Uh, do you want me to talk or do you want to talk? So what Takahito is showing you is, um, is, again, apologies to folks who saw this this morning, <clears throat> is just trying to show how Catmull Clark, how Catmull Clark subdivision is a useful representation for, um, for, certainly for film production, and we hope for other uses as well. So here we're loading our Maya Viewport 2.0 plugin, which implements Open Subdiv and is also part of the open source distribution. And again, you can see, just from those eight CVs, we've generated that nice, smooth limit surface. Now, the surface, that, 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 that smooth limit surface is entirely generated on the GPU. 
Um, the Maya plugin only knows about the blue edges that you see, and that's how you control what you're, how you control the model. But that nice organic surface is completely generated on the GPU and doesn't have to bog down your Maya session or introduce any other overhead in that way. So here, we're hoping, you know, this is something that we really strive for internally at Pixar, is to be able to give artists the true representation, what they're going to see in the render all the time, um, and not have to show, not have to give them, make them guess about what they're seeing, or when you have um, a character's hands and they put their hand to their face. We want to show them exactly where that contact is. We don't want to have to show them a polyg polygonal approximations. And here you can see the same. We want to, we're, we're trying to present a world in which the artist can see the true surface at all times. And we want to give them the control like we have here with creases. As Takahito mungs the sharpness of that crease, that's changing the surface um, to, to, give you, to give you a lot of organic control without having to add new spans, without having to cut CVs, without having to change your topology and then change your shading or whatever else changing topology, give, changing topology can give you in terms of weight or uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline disruption. Um, by just dropping these creases on and moving them around, you can really control what that surface looks like. Um, we didn't show you hierarchical edits, but that's another way of adding really high resolution detail um, on the surface. And here you can see that adaptive tessellation again. We only add the CVs where you need them. The tessellation here levels are a little bit artificially low here so that you can see what's, what's going on. But as you mung the sharpness of those creases, we're, we're, we're dropping in topology just where you need it. And that's key to, um, that's key to really getting high performance out of open subdiv. Um, there's a, a bit of a caveat with this test. Um, this, there's a, an analysis that we do on the topology of the mesh in order to generate those cubic patches. We're redoing that as we add faces here. Um, we've optimized open subdiv in the current implementation for, um, for generating static, um, st for static topology. Here you can see we're modifying the tessellation levels on the fly. Um, but we've, we're gener for, for, our, for our uses, the best performance that we see is with static topology and then we modify that static topology via deformers and show the animators the result. Um, I think there's a little bit more work for us to um, make it uh, across the board a modeling solution as you change topology, but you can see the promise of what you get out of a solution like that. So again, this is um, our Maya Viewport 2.0 plugin included as part of the distribution. Um, for the Maya folks in the room, we might have a couple questions a little later about how to um, how, to, how, to, how to tweak our API, our, our API usage there. That was, very, uh, it was a learning experience for us to use the Viewport, uh, Viewport 2.0 API. I mean, we'd like to learn a little more about it. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna go into architecture. David, you wanna do architecture? David Yu, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. So, um, so we're going to uh, dive into the implementation of Open Subdiv a little bit, and um, and so in in the presentation today, we're we're mostly focusing on on the um, on using Open Subdiv for for display to the to the viewport, and that's a really important use case. But there are other cases as well, and um, uh, there's also a, a projecting um, points onto the limit surface to compute um, surface collisions or to drive um, deformations. Um, also to, uh, to, to place the root CVs of hairs on characters. And, um, and, and so um, this is, it was important for us at the studio and also within the design of Open Subdiv to make sure that we took all these things into account. And so, so the core of Open Subdiv is, is sort of um, separated into these three aspects that, that we call draw, which is the, the part of open subdiv that's focused on viewport display, um, eval, which is a, a, our module for doing um, surface projection, and then compute, which is um, the, what we've identified as, a, as the common core that can feed into both the draw and compute modules and, and, um, and, and gives us a, a nice way to factor out the code. Um, and so as a, as a view into what's, what's happening there, so there's a lot of a lot of labels on here, but um, what this is showing, the, the labels uh, coming off of each pi wedge are, represent the, uh, the different backends, computational backends that we've implemented for each of these, each of these modules. And, um, and, and so the, 
the, the compute module, which is mostly focused on, on core computation, refining the subdivision surface, um, uh, sort of afforded itself the most opportunities for, for implementation in, in, in different places. And so, so, so OpenSubdiv um, includes both a simple, single-threaded C++ implementation that you can think of as, as like a reference implementation, um, but we also have, um, have an OpenMP implementation for using all of your CPU cores as well as, as um, backends that, that use the GPU compute APIs like CUDA and DirectX um, compute or, or, um, or, or, or OpenCL or, or even um, you know, OpenGL's transform feedback mode. Um, on, on the, uh, let's see, on the draw side, um, we, we, we support both OpenGL and, and DirectX, as well as um, uh, the ability to use uh, OpenGL ES. And, um, uh, and then the, currently, we're looking at, at, um, at implementing the eval API on, uh, on the CPU, but we also believe there's opportunities for, for doing uh, GPU acceleration of, of eval. And so there's, on, on the slide, there's some asterisks and notes, and, and those are mostly related to to um, you know aspects of of the, the current state of the of the source repository, but um, but we've been designing for for this set of, of, of APIs, um, and uh, so a couple things. One one is that we believe OpenSubdiv will run everywhere, um, and uh, and and this is cool. What, within within Pixar, um, we found that um, well. One, one thing is is that run, runs everywhere has a, has a few different axes on it, and 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 one nice thing is that we have the ability to sort of mix and match these different modules as, as makes sense. And so, um, with within Pixar, we've you know we found that that using CUDA compute and OpenGL draw is giving us kind of our best throughput for for our current use cases, but um, but but by um, exposing this 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 sort of matrix of different implementations, it's, it's nice to know that, that our implementation can even run on low power devices like OpenGL ES that don't have tessellation hardware, but still do uniform subdivision using our, um, uh, one of our compute APIs. Um, so, and this is, again, you know, that, that flexibility allows us to run on, on, on various platforms as well. And so we have, um, Examples in, from the community of, of, of implementation of OpenSubdiv on Android and iOS, in addition to to the workstation platforms. Um, so continuing to dive dive deeper, um, and 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 this is starting to get even more nerdy. But this is like if if you're looking at the OpenSubdiv code, you know what what might you find? And and at the heart of OpenSubdiv is our um, geometry representation. And, um, and this is the, you know, the in-core representation of the subdivision surface that OpenSubdiv can use to do refinement or analysis. And, and in OpenSubdiv, our geometry representation, representation is actually two pieces, um, and, that, and those are identified by the HBR and FAR boxes there. And I'll talk about those a, a little bit, in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we why we have this this sort of two two parts is is continuing this theme of of, of flexibility that um, that we wanted to be able to for client code to be able to use the parts of OpenSubdiv that that make the most sense for the client's use case and only pay for the parts pay the runtime costs for the parts of the implementation that you're actually using. So so of those, so now focusing on the HBR and and FAR. So HBR is the half edge or hierarchical boundary representation. And, um, and, and this is actually the, the core bit of code that, that OpenSubdiv shares with the PR man implementation. Um, and and um, as the slide says, um, you know, this is a full mesh representation. It's sort of pointer based in your CPU and, and, it, um, and, it's pos and, and this is what PR man uses to dice subdivision surfaces when it's, when it's um, doing rendering. Um, and, but most importantly, it, it is the, the shared representation for all of the hierarchical edits and, and sharpness um, values. And, and, and by, um, by using HBR as the foundation of OpenSubdiv, we guarantee that, that, that the surfaces that we're producing are the same as what we get from our PR man renders. Um, below, below that is, is what we've called FAR, or our feature adaptive representation. 
And, um, and Dirk was describing earlier this um, streaming feature adaptive um, uh, representation that we use. And, um, and, and so this is a module that, that walks the, the mesh, the HBR mesh, and, and produces the, the tables that we can use for, um, for computation in, in the GPU. And, and again, you know, this is, this is a, a refinement API that, that's mostly um, focusing on, on topological analysis. Um, uh, yeah. So, so below that, what, at, once, once, we've, um, once we have the, the feature adaptive representation, we need to draw it. So, so if we're going to the display, um, uh, we, we need to do some drawing. And, and, and so to, to, because the feature adaptive um, analysis is producing a set of bicubic patches, we need specific geometric shading code in the, the graphics processor to do, to do the display. And, um, and so there's, you know, there's a diagram here of sort of the canonical um, uh, you know, shader pipeline that's, that's in OpenGL, and there's a similar um, shader pipeline for DirectX. And, and in order to, to draw the different types of bicubic patches, we need to be executing specific shader code on, on those stages. And, and so the open subdiv implementation provides the, the, the shader source code in GLES or GLSL or, uh, or HLSL for the two platforms, as well as some, some frameworks and, and patterns for, for managing that code. Um, because we really want, you know, needed to make sure that this wasn't just a cool technology demo of how to use uh, feature adaptive rendering, but really a, a way to integrate it into, into applications like Maya or, or Pixar's own in-house tools. Um, and uh, so, so beyond the, the overall structure, um, as, as we'll see in, in a bit, um, we, the, the, the support for the geometric shading within Open Subdiv also has some hooks to allow for um, for for appearance shading code to be to be layered in atop the geometric rendering that that we're doing, and um, and so in, so in the examples that 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 will show of using uh, p texture or or lighting and things like that, the the open subdiv core shaders don't implement any of that appearance. They're they're strictly focused on on uh, on geometry, but but the shaders are plumbing through the the UV data. And, um, and, and p-texture coordinates such that um, the, the client's downstream uh, shading code can pick it up and apply textures and, and, and lighting as, as necessary. Um, and so with that, let's uh, show you what some of that might look like. So here we wanted to show you um, we wanted to show you a, a real character, um, and this is a, a, a this is in a, in a high performance standalone um, standalone viewer that we have, um, but we can also run this inside of Maya. <clears throat> so here we have that smooth limit surface that we saw before, um, described by that control mesh. But you can add a lot more detail on top of that surface. Um, so we start out with this uh, we start out with this control mesh, and then we can add in color. Um, we can add in um, what's next? We can add in ambient occlusion. Um, we can add in um, displacement and uh, displace normals via displacement map. These are all uh, p-text maps that were generated. We're showing the turtle barbarian model from uh, Jesse Sandifer at chickwalker.com. We'd like to thank him for letting us use this model. So here we, we want to show that what, what you can do, what we're doing on the GPU is we're generating that limit surface, that smooth Catmull Clark exact limit surface that we talked about earlier, and then we're layering on a lot of high resolution detail um, on top of that using texturing. And we're doing it all at very high at very high performance. So this is this is more of the experience that we're trying to give the Pixar animators. We're trying to give the Pixar animators an experience where they can see something that they can trust, something that is going to match the render, has a lot of high resolution surface detail on it, and is also high performance. Um, so as you can see here, what we're doing we're doing at about 2.2 million, 2. Point, we're doing about 3.6 million, about 3 million uh, about 3 million polygons, and we're hitting 40 FPS which is 120 million um, Catmull Clark samples um, per second. Um, and this is running on a laptop. Um, so that we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to not have there be a reason to go with approximation when you're trying to see this kind of surface result. And so here we have, um, we have specular maps also read in from PTEX. And we're showing um, a lot of detail here. And we're trying to show it 
at interactive frame rates and in a way that um, and in a way that you can you can know is going to is going to match what you see later. So here, as we turn off color, you can see a little bit more of what's going on with the real surface and all of that p-text detail that you can see. Um, this is something that if you were trying to do uniform subdivision and trying to see some of that displacement, you wouldn't be able to do it because you'd have to subdivide the entire thing so many times that you just totally thrash your GPU memory. Um, but here, what we're doing is we're generating, we're, because we generated those patches, and you can see some of the patches, the, the patch colors here, we can do that tessellation on the fly. So um, maybe we can pick a couple areas and zoom, um, zoom in and out, and we can show that we can show that the GPU is deciding on the fly. It says, oh, this patch is close to the screen, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to need to subdivide it some more to be able to give you the visual fidelity that you need close to the screen, whereas the back arm is tessellated much less because it's far away. Um, so I, and I think it's, it's important to note the number of primitives that you see there on the lower, on the lower left. Um, that, that number changes a lot as you zoom, as you zoom in and out. We're at about 200,000, and then you zoom in a little bit more, you suddenly, draw, you suddenly bump up to a million. Um, we're also culling patches that are outside the view frustrum so that we don't have to tessellate those. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time optimizing the view dependent tessellation. We mostly wanted to show that we have a framework that you can do whatever kind of, kind of adaptive on the fly view dependent tessellation you'd like to do and be able to really give you that, real, that high performance. And again, it's just, I love watching that number of primitives change because for so long we could never do anything like that. And I think that that gives you that really shows what these GPUs can do and what tessellation hardware was really set up to do with something like the Kepler and NVIDIA GPU here. Um, and, and again, to, 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 we, we echoed this point earlier, but to say it again, we don't have to store those 2.3 million polygons. We never, you know, we only stored the number of vertices, which is below that, that 300,000. That's the number we actually store on the GPU and the subdivision tables. And then everything else is, to, is, is the GPU, all 1,300 cores on this particular box laptop that we're running with, takes that patch, dices it down, renders it, and then drops the, drops the memory right away. Um, and the hardware, NVIDIA sets up their hardware to do this sort of thing. So this is, this is you know, we're trying to be able to, to, to set up something that is really using the hardware as it, as it should. Now we're showing some of our programmer animation. This is not Pixar animator animation. Um, you know, but as this guy bangs his head, you can just watch the number of samples go up and down based on the proximity of his head, based on what's culled out of the viewer and what's not. So I think you know, it's really interesting to, we're, we're hoping, certainly for our, our, our real time, um, you know, we don't do real, real time like video game real time. But for our real-time performance, when we have models in front of animators, we're trying to give this kind of adaptive performance. But we're hoping that this implementation is also something that you know, real-time content providers might be interested in, um, having DirectX compute and DirectX implementation on, on Windows and being able to do real-time tessellation on the fly. You know, we're hoping that that's something that's interesting to, um, to real-time content providers. Um. Yeah, I think that's all the points we wanted to hit here. Um, but again, 50 frames per second, 1.7 million polygons. Um, you know, real time, you know, high performance is kind of our thing. And we hope it's yours too. Yay, Turtle Barbarian. Um, is there anything else we're going to show? It's pretty good. So let's jump to, um, we have a few more slides left, and then we can open it up for some, uh, some questions. Thank you, Takehiro. Takehiro Tajima, we are very lucky to have him. He's the master. Um, so again, this is an open source project, um, and we're very happy that it is an open source project. Um, we're developing it on GitHub. The developers on GitHub, you know, the, the, four, de uh, the four developers in the GPU team developed this library entirely on GitHub. We check in. Well, those guys more, but we check in um, probably 10, 12 times a day onto GitHub, onto, into live code. And then at Pixar, we download that, we download the GitHub source and we build it directly out of GitHub. We don't have other versions of the library that we use internally. I think the term is eating your own dog food, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, we have seen a very active developer community, and we're pretty excited about that. Um, I think we have, uh, this numbers have gone up a little bit, but we have about 800 people who are watching this, and we have um, 78 developers who have forked this repository into their own development space um, to be able to work on it. Um, we have, um, I forget everybody's name, but we have a number of uh, folks who are developing on GitHub. Um, we have somebody who forked it off and who's doing Android development with OpenSubdiv. Um, we have um, Dneg in London uh, forked off a version of this um, and has been doing, um, they did uh, uh, 
phase varying UV interpolation, uh, Trina Roy and Francisco um, at DNAG implemented that for us, and we're very happy to have them dive in. Um, and we also have a, folks, a couple of folks who've been doing some Mac OS, and I think we have some iOS development there, um, but we haven't been following it very closely. So we're trying to really build up an online community of active and interested developers um, that, crosses, that crosses the planet. Um, we also have a website, I'm not going to show it right here, um, but if you go um, later, please go to graphics.pixar.com open subdiv. Um, that's, where, um, that's where we have um, a, a, number of, um, a number of interesting things. We're trying to beef up the website a little bit probably over the next couple of weeks. It's a little bit sparse right now, um, but you can see some good information there. So what's next? Um, so we have, this is our, our, our 1.0 release, and we think that it's feature complete. We think all the APIs are complete. Um, we'll probably open this up um, for, to be completely open um, to the public maybe um, later this week um, or early next week. And we'll probably land some stability and performance optimi optimizations on that code base as more people start to use it um, and as, more, as we get more usage within Pixar. Um, but we think that that 1.0 release is, is feature complete and ready for anybody to try out if they're interested. And then the eval API that David talked about earlier, that we're targeting for release at uh, SIGGRAPH 2013 in the summer. And that again is taking points and projecting them onto subdiv surfaces, intersecting rays with subdiv surfaces, um, getting those projections and getting parametric coordinates at back and then evaluating um, positions and normals and shading data at any arbitrary UV. Um, so those are, those are the APIs that, that, that's the API that will come over the summer. We're certainly evaluating all that shading, shading data and normal now, but, but, but it's, designed for an, it's designed really for a drawing, API, for, for drawing usage um, rather than arbitrary eval, um, but that's coming. Um, this is our release, can, can, our release can, calendar. Um, so um, SIGGRAPH Asia, we're going to uh, Singapore later this week and we'll be demoing there and the release candidate will be open. Uh, release again, release 1.0 in January and then August release uh, 2.0. Um, so we are, we, we are trying to do a lot of outreach to um, hardware manufacturers. Um, NVIDIA has been very good to us. Um, we have a close relationship with their dev tech team um, and with their R&D team and um, they've helped us uh, in terms of optimization. Um, Julian at NVIDIA spent some of his personal days doing optimizations to our CUDA kernels to optimize the memory access. So we're, we're doing a lot of good work with NVIDIA. Um, we are reaching out to software vendors. Um, you know, we have, we're very excited to, talk, to, to be working with Autodesk, um, the Foundry, um, also other content providers, um, DreamWorks, uh, DNEG, other studios we've had conversations with. So it's a very active, uh, active area of discussion. Um, so, and it is open source. We, have, um, we do have a, a, a CLA agreement. This is, open subdiv is governed by the, um, by the Microsoft public license, which, is, is, which basically says it's free for everybody and the patents that are part of it are also free. Um, so the CLA agreement that anyone who wants to contribute to the code basically says any code that you contribute to open subdiv is also going to be governed by the Microsoft public license. Um, so it's a very non-binding, it doesn't say that you have to sign your life savings away or that every content you ever create will be owned by us. It's a very open licensing agreement, um, but we hope folks are interested in signing a CLA and contributing. And please do go to graphics.pixar.com open subdiv to, to learn more. And again, thank you. Thank you, Jesse, for letting us use the model. Um, thanks to Box for letting us use this sweet laptop um, and Microsoft for the research that they've been doing and NVIDIA for the continual help that they give us in this project. And thank you. That's all we have.